James chapter 3, we are continuing on in our series on James. We're calling it Faith That Works because it's a faith that functions, it works in our lives, and it's also a faith that produces something. And we talked about that in a big way last week. And this week's passage is really a continuation of that, seeing words as one of those works that we produce uh, when our hearts have been changed and transformed by Jesus. Now, I, I've got a couple phrases that we probably all are familiar with from our childhood or even beyond. And help me out finishing these. Sticks and stones may, but, but words will never hurt me. That's right. How about this one? I'm rubber and you're glue. Whatever you say. You know this one? Some of us do. Yeah. Somebody's really excited about that one. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, these are great little statements that, you know, I think we, we say them to our children, we mean well, we are trying to help them, like, hey, you can't just focus on what everybody else thinks of you. Here's the thing about them, though, they're completely untrue, right? And at the end of the day, words really can hurt, really can hurt, and a lot of times when someone says something to you, it's not bouncing off, and sticking. It's, it's hitting you, and it's sticking, sometimes for a very very long time. James starts this passage by giving a very scary and specific message to teachers that I'm just going to meditate on later, okay? Um, And always I'm meditating on. He's like, hey, you got to be careful. If you're going to teach, man, you got to be careful because that influence is important. And that's true anywhere where we have influence. And so we got to keep that in the back of my minds, in our back of our minds as we move forward. Any place we have influence, work in our families and things of that nature, we have to be careful what we do with that influence. But in verse two, he really makes this universal. He says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect or they're complete. They're able to keep their whole body in check. Now, a couple things going on here. I mean, we all know that none of us are perfect, right? <laughs> this is something they've all, we've always known. People have always known this because we try and then we mess up. And so James is basically saying, look, we, we are going to make mistakes with our words. And at the same time, he may not be saying we're aiming for absolute perfection, but he's saying when you, when we get to a point where we have control over ourselves, the last thing we get control over is our tongue. It is our words, especially in those times where we're stressed, where we're hurried, where we're, uh, you know, just feeling like we're out of control. That's when things tend to slip out that we didn't mean to say, but we do mean them a lot of times, right? So James addresses, he aims to address a universal problem that we all have. We all mess up with our words. I just saw this yesterday. I was at a red light. You guys know where I'm going with this already. Uh, and it was one of you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was at a red light on Beck Road heading south, and someone was coming off of M14. You may be familiar with the intersection there. And um, there was a line of cars waiting to come off of the freeway, and the first one in line was not getting the memo. I think it had something to do with that, you know, the, uh, right across from them, that lane doesn't have to slow down at all to get onto M14, going, going uh, the same direction, going east. And so they're seeing these cars, like, whoa, those cars aren't stopping. I can't turn. So he was, this person was a little bit stressed out about making this turn. And so they were double clutching and taking their foot off the brake and then hitting it again. And the person behind them just started like laying on the horn, you know, which makes it so much better every time, right? Uh, not in this case. And so this driver is even more confused and eventually he realizes, okay, I can safely make the turn. He makes the turn and I got to have a great front row view of the expression and the mouthing of the words that the person behind him was saying, at, directed at the car. She was unhappy, I think. Very unhappy. Sometimes it comes out in those situations as a total stranger. Um, but we don't know what's going on with that person. We don't know what's causing them to, to you know, miss the memo on a light, whatever I call it, red light mode when Mackenzie does it. Um, and then she gets me because I do it too. Um, but, you know, this, this car, this, this driver was just so furious and you could see it. I mean, you could really see it. And had you been in the vehicle, you would have heard it as well. But we all mess up with our words. Sometimes our weaknesses behind the wheel. Sometimes our weaknesses with those closest to us. Sometimes our weaknesses when we're by ourselves. Sometimes our weaknesses when we're frustrated or we're late. Whatever it might be, we make mistakes with our words. James says in verse 3, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. And likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. He gives us great illustrations. James gives us some awesome illustrations in this passage. He starts off with this discussion about horses. I don't know if you're um, somebody who's ridden horses before. There was a period in my life when my family, I've told you before, we grew up in Australia for a few years. My 
Dad took a transfer for work. We had three, three and a half years where we, where we lived in Australia. We would do a lot of horseback riding for some reason in Australia. We did that because the scenery was beautiful. You could see kangaroos and whatnot. And we would go to the same place most times that we went horseback riding in Australia. And I was always jealous because my brother continually was able to request and be granted the horse named Redwood. Now, Redwood was called Redwood because it was gargantuan. It was a huge horse, and it was kind of reddish-brown in color. And Danny, my brother, always got to ride on Redwood, and I was always a little bit jealous of that. One time, we decided to go to a different place to ride horses, and the horses were completely unruly. My sister's, my older sister's horse kept b- trying to bite her, and eventually it took off running through the woods, and so we were down a horse. Uh, it was a dis- complete disaster, so we went back, and we continued to ride with Redwood from then on. The thing that you're trying to control the entire horse with, which oftentimes weigh uh, over a thousand pounds, is a little bit in their mouth that's like this big, five or six inches that goes across the inside of their mouth, and tells them which way they need to turn, which way they need to go, when they need to slow down. Um, and that's how we control a horse. And it's this giant animal. And it's controlled by something very small. And then he talks about, he talks about boats. In our, in our uh, time, you think about just huge, huge boats, maybe a cruise ship or a military boat, like the USS Eisenhower. It's a crew that has over 6,000 people on this. Almost a hundred aircraft carrier can, or aircrafts can be carried on this boat. And the rudder is one-tenth of one percent of the size of the ship. That, that is pretty amazing. I know I called it a boat a second ago. Todd, I'm sorry, it's a ship, I, I'm, I'm told. Uh, it's a ship. And so at, at the end of the day, this huge vessel controlled by something relatively very, very small, in size relative to the rest of it. What is James' point when he talks about horses, he talks about ships or boats? What is he talking about? He's saying that the tongue may be small relative to our to ourselves, but the tongue is powerful. The tongue is extremely powerful. Again, James has some relationship in his writing between writings of Jesus, which we'll see later, and also the uh, Proverbs especially, because really it's like a New Testament book of wisdom. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, it says, the tongue has the power of life and death. The tongue has the power of life and death. In other words, the tongue has the power to build up, and the tongue has the power to tear down. We can speak words of life, we can speak words of death. Think about the powerful words that have been spoken to you in your life. Think about those defining moments. Most of us could think back to whether it's our childhood or sometime in the past, and there are certain phrases, certain things that people have said to us, for good or bad, that have almost become defining moments, have, have really informed a lot of the way that we live out our lives it's a, it creates a lens where we see other relationships. It creates a lens for how we see ourselves. Words have a lot of power, a lot of power, the power of life and death. James continues with his series of illustrations uh, in verse 5. He says, consider what a great forest is set on fire by, by a very small spark. Think about like forest fires. We're seeing a lot of them as of late in, the, in, in recent years. Um, in, in the drier areas of our, of our country, forest fires that just engulf acres and acres and homes and land and for, all this, just all sorts of things. And it just takes things out. And it always starts with something small. It starts with a misplaced cigarette or something or a lighter or a campfire. Something small creates this enormous destructive fire. He says the tongue is also a fire. It's a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Strong words, on purpose. Strong words that James is using here. has the power of life and death. And sadly, sadly, with, with the power of our tongues, most often it's true, and I'm imagining for most of the people in the room as we're thinking back to those defining things that have stuck with us and we can never get rid of, never outrun, a lot of those things that we thought of are probably negative things that someone said to us or someone has said about us that stick with us because the tongue is not only powerful, but the tongue is destructive, And when it comes to the power of life and death, what we find is we often, when we're not being intentional, because this is what happens when we're not intentional, we end up using it for the negative. 
instead of in the positive sense. The tongue is destructive. Remember that movie, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles? Anybody remember that? 1987 movie, uh, John Candy, um, and uh, I'm drawn to total blank. Steve Martin, thank you. And uh, basically, Steve Martin is like an executive. He's sort of high strung. And John Candy's this like kind of nice, nice guy, but he's a little obnoxious, right? And they end up locked in this travel plan, trying to get home for Thanksgiving, which we have coming up. And he just, John Candy just gets under the, the skin of the character played by Steve Martin. And eventually, um, he just unloads on him. He just unloads for like three minutes. He just starts saying everything he's been thinking for the past couple of days. And it, it comes out, it's a very powerful scene because most of us have been in that position on one side or the other. And you also see in that scene, Steve Martin, his, as he plays the character, the, his face realizes what he's done at the end of what he says to, to the character played by John Candy. Just a powerful moment. It has this destructive power and we oftentimes end up using it in that sense. Again, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, very similar verse. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. When we're reckless, when we're not being intentional, we pierce like a sword. We, we can have great power for destruction, and we unfortunately uh, create a lot of harm, and a lot of, a lot of uh, unfortunate things happen because of our careless words. James continues in verse 7. He says, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, a lot of times the animals we tame are not perfectly tamed, but we can get them to do some pretty wild things. You know, you see what, what they can do with whales even. You can see, you can go to the circus and elephants and lions, all these different animals. There's a big TV show that got really popular called The Tiger King. And, you know, it's about keeping tigers and being able to be in with a, an animal that would instinctively tear you to pieces, but you can tame it and get to a point where you can be around it safely. Man, we've tamed all sorts of things in our world, and we have a really remarkable skill as human beings of taming animals. And and we cannot get control of this tongue. We cannot tame it. Uh, there was a long time where I was doing student ministries. Many of you know that. For a while, I was a middle school pastor. We would do a series every few years called Taming the Tongue based on this very passage. And so, of course, like any good youth pastor, in order to illustrate this, I would go to Eastern Market and I would buy a whole cow tongue. And I would show up at 6 in the morning at various students' houses and wake them up with it because the illustration was... This tongue is impossible to be tamed. I, I cannot tame this tongue. It's, it's just out causing trouble. And that Dylan has been, where's Dylan? Dylan has been woken up by a cow tongue before. I think Jacob has too. We couldn't verify that for sure because he would, he would have blocked that memory out. And I've, I've just done it to too many students that I can't remember. I would show you the videos, but they're really weird. So we're not going to do that. Uh, but taming the tongue, it's uncontrollable. The tongue is uncontrollable. That's what James is saying. It's uncontrollable. It, we cannot tame it. We cannot tame it, at least not on our own. It has a sense of being an uncontrollable power, almost an uncontrollable evil. And as James transitions to this last portion of the passage, it really gets to the core of the issue of why. Why it seems like the tongue is uncontrollable. He says in verse 9, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings, like the person in the car in front of us, who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh, or can both fresh and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Now, James is pointing out a contradiction. Like, we, we are trying to do both of those things. You know, we praise and we curse. It's like the same spring, but two different things are coming out of it. But what he's really getting at is this, the idea that the tongue is revealing. It's revealing something that's underneath the surface. It's revealing the true character uh, that's going on behind the scenes. And he doesn't come up with this on his own. This is, once again, this is one of those times where, where James is leaning heavily on the teaching of his half-brother Jesus, who spoke on this in Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 33. Jesus says, Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. 
Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad, for a tree is recognized by its fruit, right? So the, the, the quality of a tree, the quality of its root system, like all of that comes out when it bears or doesn't bear fruit or fruit of varying qualities. And we see what this tree is really all about. Or as James, put, James puts it, what kind of tree it really is? What type is it? Is it a, is it a vine or is it a, is it a fig tree? Like we, we see that by the fruit that it bears and it can only do uh, one thing. And so that it really comes down to the root. It reveals the root of it. Jesus says, and he's talking to some religious teachers, he says, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Some other versions uh, say, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever we're filled up with, whatever's like strongest inside of us, that's what comes out in our speech. That's what that is. And so sometimes we say something or we have that moment of weakness and out it comes. We're like, oh, where did that come from? The answer of where did that come from is right here. It's a great opportunity where we've seen something be revealed. Now we have to respond to it. None of us are going to be perfect, but we see our hearts revealed when things come out of our mouths that we may regret. Jesus carries on, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word, every vain word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. We, Jesus is talking about a heart-level thing that comes out in our words. And the reason that the tongue feels like it's untamable because really it's not about taming the tongue. It's about, it's about changing the heart and transforming the heart. That's how we tame the tongue. We allow our hearts to be changed and our hearts to be transformed. It's the difference between behavior modification and heart level transformation or sanctification, which is the idea of Jesus getting a hold of us and turning our lives into something that brings him honor and glory and that imitates him. We tame our tongues by surrendering our hearts to him. And ultimately, that's what he wants. It's very consistent throughout the Bible. He wants our hearts. And anytime he talks about our actions, like last week and this week, and our words, it's a deeper thing than that. He's talking about wanting our hearts, and then our actions follow. And Jesus talked about that. He says, clean the inside of the dish, and the outside will be clean also. Follow me with your heart, and your, the way that you live will follow after. So really that's our task, is how do we draw close to the God of the Bible? How do we draw close to our Savior, who is the same God? He's the same Savior. He's saving then. He's saving us now. He answered, he answered prayers then. If you see his faithfulness in his word, he does that now. How do we give our hearts to that God? We look back. That song is just a great picture, actually, of what God's people would do, especially in the Old Testament. They would look back at his faithfulness. They would see his activity in their lives over the generations, his consistency, the way that he moved among them, the way that he came to save, that he came to rescue. And they would say, see, he's at work, and that's the same God who's at work now in our lives. And so when things seem crazy, when things seem out of control, when it's a struggle to walk with him, we need to look into his word, we need to know his word, <laughs> we be prepared for those times by being a, a people of his word, getting to know all of the things that he's done to be faithful to us, all of the ways that he promises to stand up in those times of difficulty where we can come to him with anything and everything that we face in life, all of those challenges. And we give him our hearts. And then when those, those times of trial come, we're ready. Those, that time of stress comes, what comes out of our mouth comes from him because he's got our whole heart. He transforms us from the inside out. Lord God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you want more than behavior modification. You want our hearts. And you have made that possible. You've moved in powerful ways. You have, you have moved in such ways that we can then become yours and have a relationship with you. You've made that, that possible for us, even though we're broken even though we all sin in many ways, even though we won't be perfect with our tongues. Lord, today I just, I just ask that you would use us and use our words 
for your kingdom and for your glory and to, to speak words of life and not words of death. But Lord, I pray that that would come out of the place of surrender, out of the place of handing our whole heart over to you and allowing you to work in us and through us. Thank you for coming and showing us how to do that, how to speak life, how to speak truth. We praise you now because we want to offer you our, our whole hearts. And Lord, I pray that it would be reflected by the way that we live, by the way that we speak. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you guys to stand as we just proclaim that we get to praise the Lord overall.
prayers before we walk out of here. Um, ultimately, you know, we worship our Lord. That's one way of giving, but um, another way is through our offering. And there are two different ways to do that. Um, online is the easiest way. It's set up super simple. Um, if you like to give in person, though, we have buckets by the doors where you can do that. Um, and if you're new here, we just want you to not worry about that. We just would love the chance to get to know you. Say hi. Thank you so much for coming. Um, you can stop by the welcome table on your way out. We'll have a little gift for you to take home. And then as always, if you need help praying about something, um, whatever it is, like I said before, nothing's too big, nothing's too small. Um, if you just feel so depleted, I, I know I've been there where I just, I can't pray. Um, we have people down here who will gather right at the end of the service um, here in front of the stage on each corner who would be more than happy to pray with you and pray with you um, through whatever you're going through. So uh, please take advantage of that. We have people who'd love to help you in that. And then as we go, uh, what a great reminder, you know, let's remember that the tongue is the revealer of the heart and God doesn't want behavior modification. He wants our whole heart. So let's remember to pursue him and tame our tongues by surrendering our hearts to him this week. Y'all have a great week and we hope to see you again next time.